Good morning. It is uh, good as usual to see everybody. I was, I was really thinking about how this time together has, has really um, uh, affected me in general and us uh, as a people. And, and I, I, I have to admit there are times when in life you feel a little uncomfortable with being somewhere. Sometimes you think, well, you know, I have somewhere else to be or or you might think, what am I doing here? You know, you get stuck on the line at Walmart, and you think, I don't know what I'm doing here. You know, where's my life going? And, you know, you have all these weird feelings when you're talking about time and places and where you are. Um, when I'm here, and I hope you feel this way too, I don't feel any of that. Because in, in my mind, the way I think about this time together, that, that myself, my family, that that. God wants us to be here, and there's something about that idea of being here, especially on the first day of the week, that is so incredibly comforting, just knowing that, that even God himself, that's where he wants you to be. And so I hope you feel that way as, as we continue this worship service um, this morning. And I say all of that to say this, uh, and it's, it's kind of a, a confession, um, here's my confession. I like to have control. That's my confession. I like to have control. And I, I really do. I, I am the kind of person that is constantly watching the clock. All right. And, you know, when I was doing band repair, I had a big digital clock right in front of me. And I had every moment timed. And if, if anything, any project or anything that I did went over even a minute, Oh, that was horrible. I just felt like the whole world was coming apart. My whole day was falling to pieces. I just, I like to have control. I like to watch the clock. I like to have control of my time. I like to be aware of what I need to be doing at that point in time. I like to be aware of where I need to be, uh, what I'm supposed to be doing with my time. Every minute, every day, every week, I like to have control over my time. And I get incredibly anxious when, when my routine gets messed up because I love routines. I love things to be the same. I love my routine every day. I love my routine every week. In fact, I, I add about this, that I don't like vacations, okay? And you may have noticed that I've been here almost five years, and we've probably taken, what, one vacation, I think, since we've been here. And, and to, to my wife's angst, I don't like vacations, all right? Um, I, I feel that it just completely disrupts my week, all right? I don't feel there's no relaxation, there's no comfort, there is pure anxiety when I don't have things set in a certain way and things are out of order and things are out of whack and things are out of timing. Um, I cannot for a moment relax because I like to have control of my day, of my week, of my year, of my life. That's what I like. And here's the thing, I like the illusion, because that's really what it is, isn't it? It's an illusion. <laughs> I like the illusion of having control over my life, because to me, to me, here's the thing, those times that I can sit down and relax, those times that I can eat a good meal, you know, and, and, and drink a cup of coffee and just kind of just, just sit there to me, that's my reward to myself for having done everything that I needed to do within a timely fashion. You know, I've stuck to the clock, right? I've, I've been right there. I've done everything I'm supposed to be doing. And then when I get to that time and I say, it's dinner time, right? That's it. I get to sit down. That's my reward because that's how my mind functions because I like to have that kind of a control. But, but really, it is an illusion, it's an illusion, because the reality is, as much as I would like to think that I have control every, over every minute, every week, or every year, or even control over my life, that the reality is, I don't. My wife does. No, I'm just kidding. No, I don't. I don't have that kind of control, do I? I don't have the control. I cannot control anything. I try to. Don't get me wrong. I mean, I really, really, really try really hard, but life just doesn't work that way. Life doesn't work that way. It's an illusion, 
but it, I like to feel like I can hold on to that illusion. And, and, and if you're still buying into the illusion, like I still buy into the illusion, because I still do, really, even though I know it's not real, I, I still buy into it. But if you're still buying into that, having control of your life, your future, that, that any, any thought of something not being the way it should be, just the thought that something might change, just the thought that, that something's going to creep in and, and things are not going to work out the way they're supposed to, just that thought creates a tremendous amount of anxiety, doesn't it? I mean, just the thought of that. And that's one of the things I like so much about this tithe, right? This, this, this little bit of time that we have on Sunday, because there's no doubts in my mind that this is going to happen, right? And we're here, and this is happening, and, we're here, and it just makes me feel comfortable, but even this, this time has been rocked, hasn't it? I mean, it wasn't that long ago when, when we, those of us who have been doing this for so long and talking about a routine, I mean, this becomes a routine. We're here every first day of the week, all of our lives, every Sunday, over and over, time and time for years and years and years and years. And we even had a time in, in our past, not too distant past, where we had to say, I can't be there, <laughs> right? During the time of the pandemic, we had to stop and realize that was painful. You talk about anxiety, <laughs> angst, that was painful to think that one thing that has always been so constant in my life has been taken away from me, and that's, that's a painful experience, but it's also a reminder to us that any thought that we may have that we have control of our lives is an illusion. It's not true. It's not real. As hard as we try, it is not real. So this is what I want us to think about this morning. This is a very simple statement, but if you really embrace it, I believe it will be life-changing to you. So think about this. God is in control of everything, and every moment is a gift. God is in control of everything. Every moment is a gift. And I believe that that reality, when you get over the idea of being able to control your life, control your history, your destiny, your, your future, and, and even go back and control your past, right? Because sometimes we try to do that too. We, we try to control everything about our life. That all of that is a waste because it's not possible. But realizing that every moment that you have ever lived, every day that you've woken up, every moment that you have been given is a gift from God will change. It's a paradigm shift. It will change how you live your life. So look with me, if you will. This is uh, Ecclesiastes chapter 2. We're going to be in verse 18. And we're going to hear the preacher of Ecclesiastes say this very thing, <laughs> that the, he's tried this. He's tried to have control. He's tried to control his work. He's tried to control his future. He's tried to control his labor. And he, too, has found that it is, what's our word? Hevel, right? It's vapor. It, it is vanity. So look at this with me in verse 18. He says, Thus I hated all the fruits of my labor for which I had labored under the sun, for I must leave it to the man who will come after me, in verse 19, and who knows whether he will be wise, a wise man or a fool. Yet he will have control over all the fruit of my labor for which I have labored by acting wisely under the sun. He says this, this is hevel. <laughs> This is vanity, right? It, it, I could relate to that. I, I see where he's coming from. I mean, I, I read this and I think to myself, oh, yes, I feel that. You know, there, there's some angst there that I cannot let go of. I, I feel the pressure that he is, he is uh, uh, experiencing because what he's saying is that he's spending his whole life and he's focusing on control and the future and, and labor and, and he's using wisdom and he's using knowledge and he's striving and he's toiling and all of the fruits of his labor. And he says, oh, it's so good until I realize I have no control over it whatsoever. Because someday he says, I'm going to die and, and somebody else is going to come and I don't know what he's going to do with my stuff. I don't know if he's going to use wisdom. I don't know if he's going to be a fool. He didn't work for it. He's just going to take hold of it and he's going to continue what I 
start it and do whatever he wants to you to it. And he says, that's vanity. It's vapor. The illusion of control, right? The thought that we can control our future and control our stuff. He says, that is vanity. Look at verse 20. He says, therefore, he says, I, I completely despaired all the fruit of my labor for which I had labored under the sun. When there is a man who has labored with wisdom, knowledge, and skill, then he gives his legacy to one who has not labored with them. This, too, is vanity. And then he adds, it is a great evil. For what does a man get in all of his labor and in the striving with which he labors under the sun? He doesn't answer that question, but we all know the answer. And the answer is nothing, right? He says nothing. When it's all said and done, nothing, right? In fact, you hand it over to somebody else. You have no idea how he's going to manage it. You don't know what he's going to do with it. You don't know if he's going to use wisdom. He's not going to appreciate it, right? He's not going to do any good thing with it. And he says that, that what good what good is having wisdom? What good is having knowledge? What good is having skill to, to labor, to work, to build a legacy, to simply give the fruits of that labor over to somebody who did not labor for it? Right? Didn't work for it. Didn't do anything. He just, he just inherited what you accomplished using wisdom. And he doesn't just call that hevel. He says, that's evil. That's evil. Right? And then we can relate to that in the sense that when, when we think about things that we're doing and, and we create something or we work for something or we strive for something, maybe it's a career, maybe it's a project, and, and we just pour everything into it, all of our emotions, all of our time, we just invest heavily into it, we feel like we have control of it, it becomes part of us, we, we put some of us into that work and we work and we work and we work and we work. And just imagine just taking that and just giving it to somebody else and say, do whatever you want with it. That person doesn't appreciate the work. That person doesn't appreciate the labor and the intensity. That person doesn't appreciate the wisdom that has gone into building or developing or creating or whatever the scenario is. He says, that's, that's not good. That's not a good thing, right? It's not a good thing for someone to suddenly inherit something they didn't work for. They didn't have any personal ties to it. They didn't have any personal attachment to it. You know, you think about the Jewish people and, and how they allowed their children to inherit their estate. Those kids worked, right? They worked that land. They worked that family inheritance. They, they became heirs long before they actually became heirs. I mean, they were in it. They had a personal tie and attachment to it. To when they inherited it, they didn't do a whole lot different than what they were doing growing up, except for they suddenly became owners of it. But all too often, what people do is they, they stumble into something. And, and the preacher says, that's, that's evil. It's not good. And we've seen people who do that, haven't we? We've seen people who suddenly just got a bunch of stuff. You know, they didn't work for it. They didn't toil for it. You know, they just woke up one day and got a letter from a lawyer and said, hey, guess what? You just inherited a bunch of stuff. And they think, yeah, that's great. You know, and then they just squander it. You know, we've seen that. Right? It, it, it corrupts people. It messes with people's heads because they didn't toil and they didn't think and they didn't plan. They just received. But, but a person who receives what was, was built and they were a part of it, it, it changes the dynamics of the relationship. It changes how we receive things. And the preacher says that, that this, this whole idea of just doing and doing and toiling and striving and working and handing it over to somebody else to do whatever they want, he says that is not only hevel, but he says that is evil. Look at verse 23. He says, because all his days his task is painful and grievous, even at night his mind does not rest. This too is vanity. This too is hevel. You see, when we believe, and I think this is where this is painful for me to even say, but when we believe that we're in control, because I have a tendency to believe that, when we believe that we can control our destiny, when we believe we can control our stuff, our life, and, and that it all depends on us. That if we don't do it, nobody else will. If I don't plan it, nobody else will. 
if I don't prepare, nobody else will. That if, if that is my mindset, if I want complete and total control of my labor, if, if I believe that the fruits of my labor are all up to me, that whole process becomes incredibly burdensome. It's a burden. It's a huge burden. In fact, the preacher says he, you lose sleep over it, right? I mean, you can't even sleep because you're constantly thinking about it. Well, what if I do this and what if I do that? What if I make a mistake? What if this happens? What if that happens? <laughs> you know, what's going to happen to my stuff? What's going to happen to my future? What's going to happen to my legacy? And he says it's such a burden. He says, I've, I've worked, and it's been painful, and it's grievous, and it's a struggle. And he says, I feel like it's a waste of time because by the time I get to the end of it all, I can't even sleep at night because I'm so worried about my future. I'm so worried about my legacy. I'm so worried about my stuff. I'm so worried about losing control that I lose sleep over this. And he says, that's That's vanity. That's vanity. Look at verse 24. He says, Therefore, is nothing, it is nothing better for a man than to eat and drink. And listen to this. Tell himself that his labor is good. I mean, as if we've been following along with, with our lessons on Ecclesiastes, a lot of times this is not how he ends, right? This idea. He often says, you know, we need to tell ourselves that everything is vanity, everything is vapor, everything is smoke. That's what he keeps telling himself over and over again. But now he's shifting gears and he's changing his thought process. And he's saying that we need to be telling ourselves that our labor is good. In other words, chill out, relax, enjoy it, right? But look what he says. This also I have seen that it is from the hand of God. See, it's, it's this coming of full circle it's this having control and trying to have control and trying to control my destiny and my stuff and my future and everything that is coming from me, that my legacy is all up to me, to saying, no, no, wait. <laughs> in your labor, in your labor, in the fruits of your labor, in your destiny, in your future, in your stuff, all that you have, everything that we just talked about, you need to think about the fact that it is good. And here's why it's good. It's good because it comes from the hand of God. And when, when God is part of that planning, when God is part of that thinking, when God is in control, right, it, then our labor becomes good. And all that we do becomes good. All that we prepare for, all that we think, all that we practice, all that we create, all that we design, all of our stuff can be good. As long as we recognize and remember that it is of the hand of God. Look at verse 25. For who can eat and who can have enjoyment without him? Right? Who can eat and who can have enjoyment without him? You know, when you're working on something and it's just, oh, it's so stressful. And you're thinking, I just don't know. How, I don't know if I have time to finish it. You know, you can't even sit down and have a good meal, you know, without just thinking the whole time that you're eating. You know, I don't know. I don't even have time to eat this food. You know, I need to get up and do something. You know, it's just there's constant feeling of anxiety and pressure to do and do and be and be. And the preacher says, I've been there and I've done that. And he says, that's, that's not good. <laughs> but he says, I also have been here. I have handed it all over and recognized that God is in control of all of it. And it is all of the hand of God. Therefore, you can, you can enjoy your meal. You can enjoy your rest. You can enjoy the things of life because you've handed it over to the person who is truly in control. And, and the preacher's point is that he is, he is revealing the true meaning of contentment. And it doesn't come from you. He's revealing the true meaning of joy. And it doesn't come from you. It doesn't come from your toil. It doesn't come from your striving. It doesn't come from your work. But it comes from God. And when we recognize that, we can enjoy. We can have contentment. We can relax. We can say, you know what? If, if God chooses to give my stuff when I die to somebody else, so be it. Right? If God chooses for my legacy to go in the hands of somebody else, that's fine. If God makes that choice and God gives me the opportunity to have and to manage and to work 
and the labor and to strive and to toil, I'll do it. Recognizing that it's a gift from God, that he is in control, that he has gifted that to me. He's gifted me my time. He's gifted me my skill. He's gifted me my wisdom. He's gifted me my labor. I will enjoy it, and I will enjoy the fruits of that. I will enjoy a good meal. I will enjoy a good rest, and I will remember that it's not up to me, but it is from the hand of God, that God is in control of the future and not me. Look at verse 26. For to a person who is good in his sight, he has given wisdom, knowledge, and joy, while to the sinner he has given the task of gathering, collecting, so that he may give to one who is good in God's sight. He says this too is vanity and striving after the wind. So in in this context, sinner doesn't necessarily mean somebody who's evil. It's just sinner is somebody who doesn't recognize the hand of God in the work of the world. That's what that is. Somebody who is striving to control their own destiny is the sinner in the context. And and so he's saying that those people who are striving to do that, you know, it's really interesting what's going to happen to them. They're going to collect. They're going to gather. They're going to do good things. They're going to produce fruit of their labor. And God is going to take all of that. He's going to hand it to somebody else. And guess who it's going to be? Somebody who looks to him. Somebody who has given control over to him. Somebody who respects God and understands that it's his hand that has control over all things, is that's what God's going to do. That other than that, the rest of it is just striving after the wind. Any effort to control your life. Look at verse 13. He says, come now. You, or excuse me, we're, we're moving into James. This is James chapter 4, verses 13 and 17. And of course, we've talked about how James has a lot to say. He uses a lot of wisdom in his writings. Uh, but more specifically, we're, we're zeroing in on this whole idea of, of labor and what it means and how we're supposed to, to live. In verse 13, James says this. He says, Come now, you who, who say, today or tomorrow, we will go to such and such a city and spend a year there and engage in business and make a profit. So he, he's just really coming down with the, a, a very specific scenario that they probably experienced, right? They probably have seen this before. You know, we know people like this. In fact, we've probably been people like this. And, and he says, you know, there, there's this, these people and they've got this plan, all right? And it's a business plan. And then they've thought it out and they're going to go execute it and they're planning on making a profit. Not unusual, not unusual. And then in verse 14, he says this, yet you do not know what your life will be like tomorrow. You are hevel, right? That's, remember that, that word in Hebrew, hevel, literally means smoke or vapor. You know, James uses the word vapor, but that's, in Hebrew, would be hevel. And he's using it more literally. You're just vapor that appears for a while, a little while, and then vanishes away, right? So he says two things about a person's life that are beyond their control. In this short little passage, these two verses, there are two things about a person's life that are beyond their control. He says, the first thing is this, you don't know what your life will be like tomorrow. That's beyond your control. It's beyond your control. In fact, we would go so far as to say that you don't know what your life is going to be like an hour from now, right? Or two hours or, or just this evening, right? We just don't know. No, no, we plan and we think, and like me, I'm always watching the clock and I'm thinking, you know, I know what I'm going to be doing at that time. No, I don't. I think I do, and I have some idea and I've got some plans, but you know what? Those ideas and plans might be rocked very quickly because in reality, James says, you don't know what your life is going to be like tomorrow. And then he says, number two, your life is literally hevel. Your life is literally vapor. It is smoke. It appears for a little while and vanishes away. And you have no control of that. You have no control of that. You have no control of your length of life. You have no control about death. That that has something, a hold on you that is beyond your control. You cannot control those two variables. And so it's it's not wrong, right, to plan for the future. It's not it's not wrong to to try to prolong your life with healthy eating. Uh, I had a good friend that 
he was very healthy. He used to work out all the time, and you know, he 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 had a, a concern that he was going to you know get sick or have a heart attack or something. He was really worried about it, and he was always eating healthy, and he wouldn't eat any sugar, and you know, he was eating all the yucky stuff, vegetables and things all the time, and and he just really wasn't enjoying anything. But he he kind of felt like you know it's worth it. It's worth the sacrifice. I'm eating healthy. I feel good. I I um, I look good. It, it, I'm going to prolong my life. And guess what? He had a heart attack. And I was talking to him afterwards, and he said, "You know, all these efforts I put into this to try to control my 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 body and my health and all the things I did to try to prevent this from happening." And he says, "I'm the one who has the heart attack, <laughs> right?" And, and he, of course, he looks around and he sees other people who are not doing that, like myself. And he says, but look at, you know, look at you. You know, you're, you haven't had any problems. I mean, see, we see that and we recognize that and we understand that that's how the world is, that, that what James is saying is so very incredibly true. You don't know what tomorrow is going to be like and your life is incredibly, incredibly short. Look at verse 15. He says, instead, you ought to say this. Oh, he's going to be playing, of course, off of the preacher of Ecclesiastes and he says, you ought to say is this, if the Lord wills, we will live and also do this or that, right? In verse 16, but, but as it is, you boast in your arrogance and all such boasting is evil. Therefore, to one who knows the right thing to do and doesn't do it, to him it is sin. And, and I, I think and I believe and I know that it is incredibly easy to get caught up in our own plans, in our own strategy, in our own future. It's so easy to be caught up in the idea that I have control over those things and to forget that God ultimately has control. It is incredibly easy to do. It is incredibly easy to forget that, that we can control our future, that we can determine the course of our life, to think that that is a reality, to make our plans, to set our goals, to think about the future, and, and doing all this, understanding that our plans and our goals are tentative. That's a hard concept for me. It's hard for me to think that way. But it is a reality. It is a reality. And the Bible talks about it, using wisdom to go and plan and prepare and even, even go so far as to, to prepare for your children's future, to make sure that things are done. We need to think that way. That's wisdom. But, but the preacher of Ecclesiastes is warning us that if we get too caught up in that, if we think that for just a moment that we're in control of all that stuff, that we have the power to determine our destiny, that we have the power to determine our future, that we have the power to prolong our life, that we have the power to do any of that, that that came from us, he says, you need to stop for a minute and realize that wisdom also says that that's not true. That every moment, every plan, every strategy, it's all tentative. That God can change it in a moment. He can control it. He can change it. He can move it. He can manipulate it. He can do whatever he sees fit to do with it. And we have no power over it. So that we recognize that our labor and our toil and the fruits of our labor, all that we do under the sun and all that we receive in our labors, that it, can, it is not, now emphasize on that word, it is not hevel. All we do, all of our labor, all of our toil, all of our striving, all of our work, it is not hevel, it is not vanity, but is good, and it is enjoyable only when we realize that it comes from the hand of God. That's where the preacher is with his thinking. It is good. All of our toil, all of our labor, all of our striving, all of our planning, all that we do is good. It is not hevel. When we realize that it comes from the hand of God, when we realize that it is a gift, and that his will, knowing that, that he alone has control over the future, makes all of our efforts good, right? I mean, our efforts become good when we rely on him to control our destiny. It makes all of our pursuits worthwhile pursuits. Otherwise, they're not worthwhile pursuits. Without God, nothing's worthwhile. 
Without God, all of our labor is vanity. Without God, all of our striving is a waste of time and a chasing after the wind. All of our building, all of our building of a legacy and a future and a fortune, doesn't matter what we're doing, all of it is vanity if we do not think of and focus on the will of God and realize that he is in control. Everything suddenly becomes vanity, right? But with God... With God, we're able to eat, we're able to drink, we're able to relax, we're able to have a cup of coffee, we're able to be content, we're able to sleep and rest easy, knowing that he allowing us and gifting us that time, gifting us that wisdom, gifting us those means, that he is the one who is ultimately in control of all things. And that allows us to enjoy not, not only the rewards of our labor, but, but the writer says, the preacher says, even to labor yourself itself can be enjoyable. You can enjoy your work, no matter what you're doing. You can enjoy it knowing that it is a gift from God. So I want, I want to conclude where we started here this, this morning on this lesson and thinking about this thought. I want you to take this with you. God is in control of everything. Every moment is a gift. God is in control of everything. Right? And don't buy into the illusion that you're in control because God is in control of everything. And every moment, every moment, this moment right here that we're enjoying together in fellowship and, and studying God's word, this moment right here, God gifted you. Right? And, and if you have another moment, <laughs> he will gift you that. And the next hour, the next hour, that's a gift. The next day, that's a gift. Next week, next year, it's all a gift. God has gifted you with that time. And, and what wisdom tells us is that we need to use that time wisely, but we have to be focused on the will of God as we do. Use your time wisely. Focus on the will of God. God is in control of everything. Every moment is a gift. This moment is a gift to those who have put on Jesus in baptism because we get to enjoy that time together and recognizing that, that we have that relationship with God. But you know, this time is also a gift for those who have not done that, who have not been forgiven of their sins through the waters of baptism, that this moment right now is a gift to you, that you right now have an opportunity because you live, because you breathe, because you're here, that you can make that choice to put on Jesus in baptism and become part of the family of God. And if that is a desire of yours, if you desire to do that this morning, the opportunity is available to you if you would come forward and we will help you with that as we stand and as we sing.